I was losing the joy of learning, and it was starting to become <sighs> annoying that I couldn't be interested in anything. I couldn't be interested in anything that took my fancy. I couldn't be interested in that clock. Why is that clock ticking? 20 seconds have gone by. I couldn't focus on anything outside what I was focused in, and partly that was to do with this, all this talk about passion. I mean, it's, it's kind of tailed off a bit now, but a few years ago, you just couldn't turn to the left or the right without hearing people being passionate, being, being asked in an interview for McDonald's how passionate they were. I mean, nobody goes to work for McDonald's because they're passionate. They just want money. They just want a job. And this kind of disproportionate use of language was beginning to make me lose my joy of learning. The second thing, yeah, the 10,000 hours, you know, the fact that you had to spend 10,000 hours on something just to become, just to become good at it. That was the kind of the, 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 the subliminal message that was being beamed. That's two hours a day, five days a week, for 20 years. That's a depressing thought. So I started to, to look around and see what were other people saying about these things. What were what was the research saying? And there's some very interesting research in, in Oslo. Oslo University discovered that only 3.4% of the population in Europe were natural specialists. Most of us aren't specialists. 96% of us aren't specialists at all. And yet we're driven into this cultural model that we, if we want to succeed, we must become a specialist. So taking that on board, I thought, OK, now let's look at the real specialists out there, who are the, the most specialized of specialists, and the, and the most successful specialists who have to be Nobel Prize winning scientists. And yet, another very interesting study, a uh, UNESCO study done by a guy called Robert Root Bernstein of, of, of the State University of Michigan, discovered that compared to regular scientists, Nobel Prize winning scientists were four times as likely to be musicians, they were 15 times as likely to be craftsmen, to do woodwork or some kind of hobby like that, and a whopping 22 times as likely to be actors, dancers, or magicians, which I really like that one. So, so all these Nobel Prize winners were, were you know, performing a kind of magic, uh, that was my segue uh, to the next bit, a uh, kind of magic, and uh, where was this magic that we could all access? And What's really fascinating is that we spend vast sums of money on educating ourselves and educating our children, and yet the methods used for educating people are really remarkably similar. They usually feature around this idea that there's a big, a big block of, of knowledge, and you go up to it, and you chop bits off it, you serve them up, you have the basics, you have the introductory course, uh, you have the advanced class, and all of these lumps are just kind of compacted together in a completely inorganic way. And I thought that this can't be true. I started to look, how do children learn? Just look at the way children learn. And children usually learn when they're not being coerced in, a, in, a, in an environment in a classroom. They find a cool thing. So if you want to learn how to skateboard, you don't go to do basic skateboard standing class. You try to learn something cool that you can show off to someone else. You try to usually do a 360 spin around on the skateboard to go 360. You practice and practice on your own, and then you tell someone, I'm learning how to skateboard, and they say, hey, what can you do? And you say, I can do this. And everyone says, what a cool thing. And if you look at the way people study martial arts in Japan, I lived in Japan for three years, and I was very interested in martial arts. And the way they study martial arts is to break it down, not just into slices in the Western way, which they call kata, but they also break it down into miniature exercises called waza. And, and an exercise is like a microcosm of the whole subject. It contains like the DNA of the whole subject. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. That's a different idea. That's not just chopping a subject up. It's taking a cell of the main subject, which has all the important elements. And then I started to talk to experts, people who were brilliant at what they did. And what was really interesting, if you talk to a, a brilliant cabinet maker, he said to me, if you can make a perfect cube of wood, you've got all the elements that you need to be a good cabinet maker. And I spoke to a sculptor from Madame Tussauds, 
And he said, strangely enough, when you're trained to be a sculptor at Madame Swords, you don't just start on effect, you don't just start on the lips or the nose, you actually start by making a skull out of plasticine or clay, and you carry that around in your pocket, and you're constantly making funny skulls, happy skulls, sad skulls. It's a microcosm of the whole thing. And that gave me the impetus to develop this as a way of learning, which I call micromastery. So a micromastery is this microcosm. And so I, one of the first things I talked to a chef, and the microcosm, the micromastery for that is making a perfect omelette. If you can make a perfect omelette, you usually have all kinds of skills that branch out into the whole subject. This was beginning to make me excited and interested because it meant I didn't have to, I didn't have to be a complete expert. I didn't have to devote my entire life. For example, in the, the uh, omelette making, I could make an omelette every day and vary the omelette every day. This uh, means that you can allow yourself to become interested in anything. So I was beginning to, to return to the joy of learning and I wanted to, I don't know, find the simplest version. I wanted to be able to give you something very simple to take away with you. And the, one of the simplest things that you can learn to do if you are studying Japanese calligraphy is to learn how to do a zero. This is how they practice, by just doing a zero like this. I'll just do a small zero. There we are. A zen zero like that. It's the simplest thing you can do. And that's the micromastery for calligraphy in Japan. It's, if you can do a perfect circle, you have the motor control and the kind of inner nous to be able to master that subject. Now, the great thing about doing a circle, of course, it's very, very simple. I began to look at what were the elements of a micromastery that were always present in all of them, and we can see them stripped down in this. The first element of micromastery is there's always an entry trick. Experts always have some shortcut that immediately allows you to level up, and that's an incredibly heartening thing to hear. So, for example, in this, the, the, the entry trick is hold the pen further up. So once you're holding the pen further up, already the circles are getting more fluent. They're better circles. There's another entry trick, which is instead of drawing with the wrist, draw with the entire arm. So draw with the entire arm. Draw with the entire arm. And you're beginning to get something different. The next thing you can do is use a brush. Use a brush to make a, a circle. Use a pen that's a different one to this one to make a circle. So there are all sorts of ways that you can experiment. And once you can experiment, you can show off. You've got something that's cool that you can show people. So these are all the elements that make a micro-mastery much more attractive as a way of learning than the normal way of learning. What other micro-masteries are there? If you want to go canoeing, I started to look at what could be a kind of microcosm of canoeing, and that was doing an Eskimo roll. I don't know if any of you are kayakers out there. But if you can learn how to do an Eskimo roll, you usually have all the skills in a kind of micro form necessary to be good at canoeing. Um, I've spoken about uh, 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 making an omelette. One of the most interesting things about making an omelette is you get instant feedback from people. You discover whether you actually should have put that olive oil in. Don't, don't use too much olive oil. That's the, 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 uh, that's the, 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 mix it with a little bit of butter and it's fine. Cut it with the butter, it's okay, but not pure olive oil, even though some people will tell you how to do that. I became so obsessed with the omelet making, I began to look at omelet making videos on, on, the t on YouTube. And Gordon Ramsay, he's not that good at omelet making. I would, I would say, I'm, I'm, I'm issuing a challenge, Gordon. I think I could match you on the classic French omelette. There are some great videos out there. It's another way to find micro masteries, but of course you have to sift out all the rubbish that's in there. And one of the ways is to use these three things I've, I've been talking about. Look for the entry tricks. Look for the simple method that immediately allows you to level up. I mean, in, in, in case of the, the, the classic French omelette, the simplest way to level up is to lift the pan off the heat. I mean, it's... I see so many people just you know, trying to change the heat down here when all you have to do is lift the pan because obviously that is crucial to not burning the damn thing. So the entry trick is that element that you need to look for. You need to look for something that's repeatable and you need to look for something that allows you to experiment. 
And that really brings us back to the beginning of what I was saying, which is where, where does the joy of learning really, really lie? It doesn't lie in just passively absorbing material. It lies in absorbing enough material to be able to have fun with something, to be able to do your own thing, to do something slightly weird or different with it. Because having fun with something is a kind of expertise in its own way. If you can have fun, you know, if, you, if you've got a computer, mostly when, when kids start mucking around with computers, they really are mucking around with it. They're having fun with it. They're not trying to follow the instructions. They are experimenting with it. And so MicroMastery returned me to that position of being able to look at the world with an experimental eye on, to give myself, to, to have permission to be interested in anything, so I could be interested in cooking, but only have to muck around with omelettes. I didn't have to worry about everything else. I could leave it. I could move to something else. If I saw a flower, I could suddenly become interested in botany. But it didn't mean I had to spend 20 years doing it. So micromastery is a way of returning yourself to that kind of prime, primeval, childish interest in everything, which is just wonderful. You can start saying yes to life. You can say no to passion, no to 10,000 hours, yes to life. Thank you very much.